United States, Admiral Moffat, the grand old man of Navy lighter than air, championed the rigid airship. He had a great ambition to see his country become the world leader. The first American-built rigid was the ZR-1, or Shenandoah. Structural parts were fabricated at the Naval Aircraft Factory in Philadelphia and assembled in the original large hangar at the Naval Air Station, Lakehurst, New Jersey. Completed in September 1923, the Shenandoah was a modified copy of the 1916 Zeppelin L-49, captured in France. The Shenandoah was a particularly important ship, not because she was up to date, but because she was the first native-built, homegrown American rigid. She made her first flight in September 1923 and flew at sea and over many parts of the country in the next two years through a wide variety of weather. In some respects, the Shenandoah was a rugged ship. In January 1924, because of a jam mooring spindle, the 74-mile gale tore her from the high mast at Lakehurst, leaving part of her bow structure dangling at the masthead. She was brought back safely, even though her two forward gas cells were deflated and much cover torn from her upper fin. The Shenandoah was the first rigid airship to moor to a floating mast such as the U.S. Navy devised and installed on the tanker Potoka. Another of her pioneering ventures was a 9,000-mile trip in the fall of 1924 around the periphery of the United States by way of mooring masts at Fort Worth, Texas, San Diego, California, and Fort Lewis, Washington. The Shenandoah was lost in the line squall near Ava, Ohio on September 3, 1925. Fourteen men, including Lieutenant Commander Zachary Lansdowne, were killed. The forward section, with eight men under Lieutenant Commander Rosendahl, was free ballooned for more than an hour and landed safely. The Court of Inquiry reported, The final destruction of the ship was due primarily to large, unbalanced external aerodynamic forces arising from high-velocity air currents. Investigation reveals that the removal of certain helium safety valves may have permitted excessive helium pressure to crush part of the structure. Inadequate weather information may have obscured the existence of treacherous fronts along the projected flight. Nevertheless, some valuable lessons were learned. Build airships with a lower slenderness ratio, length to maximum diameter. This makes a stronger ship. Build a control car as part of the hull, so it can't be torn away. Put the engines inside the hull. This gives better streamlining and makes the engines more accessible. All these and other improvements were realized in the later ships, Akron and Macon. Meanwhile, as part of her reparations, Germany had been required to build an airship for the United States. The ZR-3 arrived at Lakehurst, October 15, 1924, and was christened the Los Angeles. In January of 1928, off Newport, Rhode Island, the Los Angeles landed on the flight deck of the carrier Saratoga. In spite of greeting her welcomers by dropping water ballast on the handling crew, the experiment proved the landing maneuver successful.
The following month, the Los Angeles made the first non-stop flight from New York City to Panama. 2,250 statute miles in a day and a half. In 1929, she hooked on an airplane in flight. Here was a revolutionary advancement, opening up a tremendous new field of possibilities. The airship and the airplane, working together in this manner, could perform many useful functions neither one could perform alone. The speed and maneuverability of the airplane complemented the longer range and larger carrying capacity of the airship. Demonstrating independence of land-based facilities, the Los Angeles in 1931 operated for three weeks from the tanker Potoka. She was away from Lakehurst 27 days, flying over 14,000 miles. The Los Angeles became a flying laboratory and schoolroom, but her operational use was limited, for in the early days, the Navy didn't have much helium. Will Rogers summed it up nicely. The Navy has two airships and only one set of helium. Nevertheless, the Los Angeles made 331 flights for a total of 4,320 hours. A so-called economy wave ended her flying career in 1932. But experiments continued on the ground until at last in 1939 Though still possessed of useful life, she was dismantled after certain structural tests were made. However, the rigid airship program of the United States received new impetus from pressure exerted by far-sighted Americans in the inauguration of the five-year aircraft building program of 1926, which included two rigid airships of approximately six million cubic feet each to be used as adjuncts of the fleet. In 1928, after winning a national competition for the design of these ships, the Goodyear Zeppelin Corporation of Akron, Ohio, was authorized to build them. And the Navy Appropriation Act of 1929 provided $8 million for their construction. In building more than one craft at a time, a big saving is affected by the spreading of engineering and development costs. Thus, while the first ship, the Akron cost $5,358,000. Her sister ship cost only $2,600,000, or about half as much. Several innovations were introduced. Instead of a single keel, Zeppelin style, the Akron and Macon had three, providing greater strength. The eight propellers were built so they would not only reverse, but also swivel through a 90-degree arc, so the ship could be pushed up, down, ahead, or astern. The weight of fuel expended was counterbalanced by an ingenious condenser that recovered water from the exhaust gas of the engines. The Akron made her first flight September 1931. Her Navy designation was ZRS-4. ZR for Zeppelin Rigid, and S for Scout. The airplane airship teamwork, inaugurated with the Los Angeles, was carried a great deal further with the Akron and Macon. They each carried five naval planes in a built-in hangar. The planes were taken aboard and released by means of a trapeze device. the maneuver became a part of regular operating routine. In a year and a half of service, the Akron piled up 1,700 flight hours in 74 flights. Her trips covered the entire Atlantic and Pacific coasts and many states in between. She flew over Cuba and to the Canal Zone. She took part in exercises with the fleet and made many experimental and training flights. The Akron was destroyed in a storm off the Atlantic coast April 4, 1933. 
almost all aboard were lost, including Admiral Moffat. The most likely explanation is that the ship was unwittingly maneuvered so close to the surface that her tail hit the water. Suspicion of structural failure is not corroborated by direct evidence. It is significant that airships have weathered worse turbulence. In any case, it should be kept in mind that later scientific developments probably would have prevented the loss of the Akron. For one thing, detailed weather information as is now available enables a ship to avoid storm areas that are dangerous. Further, at the time of the Akron, altitude was indicated simply by a barometer calibrated in feet. This is not necessarily the true altitude. For instance, it is known that at one time the altimeter read 1,600 feet, while the Akron was actually no more than 1,280 feet above the surface. In modern aircraft, altitude is registered by radio altimeters, which do indicate true altitude. and other electronic devices, such as LORAN and radar, have greatly increased flight safety. The Macon, sister ship of the Akron, was under construction at the time of the Akron crash. She was commissioned in 1933 and based at the Naval Air Station, Sunnyvale, California, which later became Moffett Field. In the next year and a half, the Macon made 54 flights flew 1,800 hours and more than 90,000 nautical miles. She launched and recovered her own planes in flight and by night in foul weather and fair, a great advancement in this technique. In 1934, an incipient structural failure during flight was detected in the stern. Temporary repairs were made but it was decided that permanent local strengthening could safely be postponed until completion of scheduled maneuvers with the fleet. On February 12, 1935, with a day's fleet exercises successfully concluded, the Macon headed home to Moffett Field. As the ship turned to avoid a squall, the upper fin tore from its forward support and two gas cells in the stern were ripped open. The loss of helium declined the stern of the ship sharply. The engines drove the Macon above the pressure ceiling, and more helium poured out through safety valves. In the brief time available, it was impossible to drop enough weight to make up for the lost helium. The big ship slipped slowly into the sea. The one bright spot in the event was the abandoned ship maneuver. Only two were lost of the crew of 83. Hindsight shows it was an error in judgment not to have laid the ship up for permanent correction of the difficulties when they first appeared. But the fleet exercises demanded the services of our only airship. It is obvious that no single unit of the fleet is sufficient to prove the type. There must be other ships for replacements and to carry on simultaneous and competitive developments. The United States, having operated only four rigid ships, nevertheless made a major contribution, improved ground handling equipment and technique. Originally, it was the custom to rely entirely on manpower in ground handling. The British introduced the high mooring mast, which was later utilized by the United States. However, the high mast was unsatisfactory because the moored ship is difficult to service and must be kept in constant flying trim. Even so, air turbulence is unpredictable. This is what happened to the Los Angeles. The giant swing of the Los Angeles hastened the development of the low or stub mast. 
and the taxi wheel at the stern was replaced by a riding out car, which prevented the stern from rising until released. The modernized mechanical docking of the Macon, using stub mast, moving on tracks, was certainly an improvement over earlier European methods. Meanwhile, Germany had developed a new commercial airship. The Graf Zeppelin was the first to be put in service September 1928. The Graf didn't use gasoline. Instead, her five Maybach engines were driven by Blaugas, a hydrocarbon fuel gas of about the same density as air. The Germans had such complete confidence in the ship that they immediately sent her on a lengthy flight with 20 passengers, freight and mail, across the Atlantic and back. The Graf more than justified such confidence. In the next six years, she made many a round trip to South America, with time out in 1929 for a world cruise, not just as a stunt, but with a payload of 6,000 pounds in passengers, mail and baggage. Lakehurst to Friedrichshafen. to Tokyo. To Los Angeles. and back